Grambling versus Southern doesn't just feel like a big game. It is a big game. And I'm going to break down everything you need to look out for in it. Oh, yeah. It's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, of course, I'm Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And don't forget... Just because the mic comes off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives, which you can see right here at the bottom of the screen. Or if you're on the audio side of things, don't forget the S on the end. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. They have you covered this season with more odds, props, and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts and i would love to know why you check out locked on hbcu every day is it for information is it for entertainment is it just because you like me just let me know in the comments or on twitter what makes you come into the show that way i can continue to amplify those facets and today's episode is all about grambling versus southern that's how we're going to spend our first two segments because this is must watch tv this is a big game and the question is why why does grambling five games into the season Mind you, why does Grambling versus Southern have big time feels? And a simple answer, because simple questions have simple answers, and that simple answer is the fact that they have both had really hot starts to the season. Southern is 4-0, Grambling is 3-1, and and honestly, Grambling's hot start starts before the conference play even starts. When I say those records, 4-0 and and 3-1, and I'm simply talking in swag play, not overall, but simply in swag play, because that's all that's going to be used to decide what is the seeding, who's the first, second, third, fourth, you know, so on and so forth. That's what's going to be used. So when I use those smaller records, I'm only talking about conference play. But Grambling's hot start, that started before conference play. Before conference play even came in, I said Grambling is the class of HBCU basketball. Admittedly, that might have been a a, a tad bit premature. I, I will admit that. But the reason that I said it was because I look at their resume. Resumes matter to me, especially when you're going into conference play. If we're talking about who should be the favorite and things of that nature, I can't catch all of the games. But what I can do is I can look at the resume. I can look at who you were able to beat. I can look at certain things you were able to do. And when you look at Grambling coming into conference play, Grambling had already knocked off two Power 5 teams, right? They had already knocked off Colorado and they had knocked off Vanderbilt. So those are two things on their resume that are really impressive wins. Nobody else could say that. You already seen them be able to put in major adjustments between their first game against Incarnate Word and their second game against Incarnate Word. They had a really close loss the first time they faced off in a tournament setting when they just when they just played each other just as a part of the schedule. You see Grambling smashed them, limited them to 39 points. So you already saw these things. They, these things were already bubbling. They were seven and five. They had a really solid record and they had really nice wins on their resume. So when they were when I was saying they were the class of HBCU basketball, that's where I got that from. That's where I was able to to make that statement and say it with a little bit of confidence. Of course, calling somebody the class of HBCU basketball going into conference play might have been a, a bit premature, but I stand on why I said it. I stand on what my logic was. I just maybe shouldn't have jumped out the window with a claim like that that early. We hadn't even seen conference play yet. And what what happens the next game? Of course, I give them the kiss of death. Of course, that's what happened. The next game that they play after I call them the class, not even a day later, the same day, I drop an episode, the same day they go to Prairie View and they lose by one point. But that doesn't really deter me, and that didn't really deter their mo- uh, their momentum. Instead, they took that loss, and they won their next three games ever since. So when I call them the class of basketball, or the class of HBCU basketball, they had a loss, a real tough loss to PV. Since then, they've been rolling. And that's the hot start that they've had. So that hot, start, that hot start, it starts in, in November or whatever, and then it continues all the way to January. There's a momentary bump in the road, but that doesn't mean that they weren't hot. That doesn't mean that they weren't good. That's still a claim to them. They've still have been really good in conference play. So even if my statement was a tad bit premature, which I admit, I should have waited on that. 
even if it was a tad bit premature, I still look at it and I say, okay, take off the, the, the braggadocious claim. Take off the fact that I said they're the class of it. And let's just look at the root of what I'm saying. Grambling is a really good team. Has that been proven in swag play? I believe that it has. So while I might have been premature, and that's the last time I'm going to say it, <laughs> accountability, right? Uh, but that's the last time I'm going to say it. I still get the gist of what I'm saying. That's a talented team that they're going to be facing off. So that's how Grambling is able to hold up their end of the bargain and make this a big time game. That's how they're able to set the scene. But let's look at Southern. And I think Southern is probably the easiest to understand. Southern is 4-0. And that initial statement speaks for itself. It says, I'm unblemished. There's nobody who has been able to be better than me in a day. And that's completely true. They played four games in the conference. Nobody has been better. And I, I don't think that they've even been, you know, I know people want to talk about strength of schedule, but I think they've been tested. That Southern game, they got the best out of Texas Southern. The best Texas Southern that anybody in the SWAC has seen this year was that first game. And no, it wasn't because, oh, Southern is just, you know, just allowed them to be in the game. No, they saw Jordan Carl Nicholas and the only ones who have seen that. And because they're the only ones who have seen that, they're the only ones who have actually seen the strength of, of Texas Southern's rim protection. This isn't a way for me to shoot some slack or, you know, give, give an excuse to my alma mater. It's the fact that some people want to want to pick that game and say, ah, oh, that's, that's not really a, a strong strength of schedule. Because the initial statement says we're unblemished. When you look a little bit deeper, some people want to try to pick at what Southern does. That's I, I can't get with that. Because the idea that they just had they just had a weak schedule, that's not something I fully agree with. So I'm starting off with TSU. I think they saw the best version of TSU. Time will tell if the best version of TSU can be successful, but we still have to see that same lineup. Then you go to PV. And when you look at PV, nobody's really questioning PV. That's a solid win. And we did the strength of schedule a couple of days ago, but for those who missed it, I'm just recapping it fairly quickly. Then you look at FAMU versus Bethune-Cookman, and I will admit, those are not the most impressive wins on paper if you're just looking at team. But if you look just a little bit to your right, you look just a little bit to your right, you'll see Southern versus FAMU. You look over to the side, you'll see an 18-point victory. You'll see Southern versus Bethune-Cookman. Look over to the side, you'll see a 27-point victory. How many teams in the SWAC are beating teams by nearly 30 points? I'll answer it for you. I don't want you to have to think about it. I don't want you to have to pause me. I'm on a roll. I want you to hear where I'm going with this. Nobody else has beaten a team by 27 points. Let's look at FAMU and Bethune-Cookman. They both played three games in conference play. They played each other. They played Southern. And ironically, they played Grambling. Do you think there's any other game that they lost big in? It's not. Gremlin didn't smash them. Southern did. Gremlin didn't beat them by, by 27 points, by 18 points. Southern did. I'm going to recognize that. Those things are important. Because, yes, you can say, oh, you play bad teams. But if I am beating the crap out of these bad teams, don't knock me for it. I have to play them. They're in my conference. It's not like, oh, weak scheduling or some crap like that no these are conference opponents that i'm going to have to play and because i have to play them let's look at how i looked when i played them i was dominant those type of things you can't pull from somebody so i'm not knocking them that initial statement of 4-0 saying i'm unblemished that's impressive when you look deeper it still holds weight that's how i look at the resume so you look at it these are at the beginning of the show i i, I posed a question at the beginning of the show i posed this question why does Southern and Grambling have big time feels? I told you simple questions have simple answers. And it's just, oh, well, they both have hot starts. Yeah, you can leave it there. But when we look in and we contextualize what that actually means, the truth is Southern versus Grambling feels like a big time game because these are two of the teams in the conference that could have claimed to be the hottest or the best at some point in the season. Grambling could have said that coming into conference play and Southern can say that right now. So if Southern wins, that just kind of strengthens the grip they have on that title of saying, yeah, I'm the best, I'm the hottest. If Grambling wins, it pushes them right back to the forefront of a conversation they never completely left or they shouldn't have completely left. So yeah, I didn't mention location. I'm sure that plays a part. But instead, this isn't like most years. It's not where the location determines the intensity of the game. This could be two teams from California and Florida. Far as far can be. And it still be an intense game because the teams are just that good. And I believe this is one of those games when we look back and be like, oh, okay. That was one of the best games and that was one of the most impactful games in the earlier part of SWAC season. 
Now we've talked about setting the scene. We talked about why this is a big time game. But beyond that, how is this game going to transpire? I don't care if it's a big time game. I don't think it's going to be a dud. And I'm going to tell you why when I break down each of these teams as we continue with Locked on HBCU. Before I get into that, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is the number one place for all of your sports wagering. If you're into basketball, you can put some money down on that. I was listening to an interesting video about the MVP odds. Go look at the MVP, the MVP odds on Bet Online and tell me do you think it's Tatum? Do you think it's Jokic? Do you think it's Giannis? Right? Do you have somebody under the radar? I heard that, that Donovan Mitchell just climbed into the top, I'll say 10 to be safe, in MVP odds. Would you like, would you like to put your, your money down on a, door, on a dark horse like that? Just let me know, man. Of course, you have the NFL playoffs rolling, and that's what I'll be putting my money down. You know, that's what you got to do. But there's only one place to do it, and that's Bet Online, the fastest, the easiest, just the best out if you want to ask me. Bet Online, where the game starts. And as we continue rolling with today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day. For your second listen, check out Locked on College Basketball because it's everything you need about the sport from all the conferences nationwide in one spot. Just like here, you can listen to that wherever you get your podcast, including this app you're listening to me on right now. So don't hesitate. Go ahead and listen once we're done here. I've talked about why Grambling versus Southern is a big time game. I've talked about why it has big time feels, but forget the feels, forget the, the, oh, the aura. Let's talk about what actually is going to happen on the court and why this is a game where somebody has to break. Somebody has to break because both of these teams are really good. They've had hot starts. And with that comes pretty quality play on the court. You don't typically get to 4-0. and You don't typically get to knocking off two power five teams by just playing okay basketball. That's not, that's, that's abnormal. Every now and then you might see something like that, but that's not happening this year with these two teams. Southern and Grambling are playing really good basketball, and they're really balanced teams. However, they do have one side of the ball that is noticeably better, right? They're number one in one side of the ball. Both of them are. And the other side is middle of the pack, so it's not bad. They're a balanced squad, but they have their noticeable strength. For Southern, that's offense. For Grambling, that's defense. Southern is the number one team in the SWAC when it comes to scoring points. Grambling is the number one team when it comes to stopping the team or stopping their opponents from, from scoring points. Excuse me. So let's look into what that means, right? Let's get into Southern first because I feel like Southern should be the first one because, you know, we, we talked about Grambling first. Let's go ahead and alternate on this segment. So with, with Southern, they can shoot. They can shoot the lights out. And not only can they shoot, they have a bunch of players who can actually do it. So... Their offense is good, but that, that's, that's number one, right? You got to be able to shoot. I don't care if you got the best facilitators. I don't care if you got the best men on the block. You got to be able to shoot. Got to be able to score points. And they do both of those things really well. They actually do it a lot from the three-point line. And you look at a guy like Tyron, uh, Tyron Lyons. You look at a guy like uh, Tyron Lyons, excuse me. You look at a guy like Bryson Etienne. You look at guys like P.J. Bird, who I feel like might not be as recognized because he's the facilitator. He's not the guy who's going to go up there and score 30 points. He's not the guy who's going to score, go up there and score 25. He's a facilitator. But you need guys like him. When you have a team constructed the way that Southern is, where you have a bunch of guys who can shoot, the reason I keep emphasizing this is because it helps their style of play. The reason I keep saying they can shoot, they can shoot, they can shoot, is because when you look at what they do, it's big. They don't have to have as many second chance points because they have one of the highest field goal percentages, not only all, all around the court, not only just from two, but also from three-point land. So when you're looking at this, P.J. Bird, he has to be able to facilitate and give it to guys like Lions, to give it to guys like Etienne, and they knock it down. That's what they do well. They don't have as many. Their, their assist-to-turnover ratio is really good. And, they, of course, they have some strong defense, and they, they get steals. They're you know, really opportunistic in that side of things. But offensively, it's about facilitating, and P.J. Bird is the leader in the conference when it comes to assists. Then you look at Grambling's defense, and Grambling's defense is a little funny to me. Grambling defense does make me chuckle a little bit when I'm thinking about it because when I was talking about how good they were coming into conference play, one of the things that I said is they have to be better. They just, they just have to be better on defense. Not in the sense that they were bad. Let me not say it like that, but they have to improve on defense because that's just typically how things go. You get into conference play, and all of your stats get better. Grambling's stats got slightly worse. Right. Instead of holding their team to 62 and a half, they're holding the team to 65 in conference play. So it's like, oh, wow, that made me laugh because 
I just felt like it was a foregone conclusion that this defense that was really good was just going to absolutely dominate. 65 is still good. 65 is still going to get you wins on pretty much every night. Matter of fact, you look at their one loss to Prairie View, they didn't even score 65. They scored 61 points and beat them. So it's, it's games like Prairie View and games like Bethune-Cookman. Was it Bethune -Cookman? No, I think it was FAMU. It was games like Prairie View and FAMU where Grambling's defense is just absolutely dominant. But then you have games like TSU and games like Bethune-Cookman where you allow more than 70 points. It's kind of a crapshoot. It's kind of a situation where you have two games where you're like, eh, defense ain't been that great. And you have two games where it's like the defense has been suffocating. This is a tiebreaker. And not only is it a tiebreaker, it's a tiebreaker against the best offense in the conference. This isn't exactly the situation where I would want to be like, yeah, let's, let's see. But this is a test. This is a test to see what are you really about. You got to snap back to that out-of-conference time if you're Grambling. And one thing that Grambling does really well, and this gets into one of the things I really want to watch, Grambling blocks shots really well. Everything else is kind of, you know, kind of dropped. They kind of fell. But one thing they have been completely consistent on is blocking shots. That Their presence in the paint is going to be great. The only problem, and now we're going to get into the actual attack of it. The only problem is, if there was any team that would be okay with having a paint penetration problem, it'd be Southern because they're proficient from three-point. Oh, I really missed the, uh, an opportunity with my alliteration. I really missed an opportunity. I said if there was any team that would, have, that would be okay with a paint protection problem, it would be Southern because they're proficient from the perimeter. That's what I should have did. That's what I should have did. But it's okay. You live and you learn. When you just flowing, you just stream of consciousness, it just, ah, man, I should have said perimeter, though. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to get off myself for that one. But we're going we gonna to push forward with the program. Y'all see the piece. Anyway, let's continue. So if there was any team that was okay not being able to score in the paint, it'd be Southern because Southern is really good at shooting threes. And Grambling's not that great at stopping them from shooting three, stopping opponents, period, at shooting threes. We'll see if they're able to do it with Southern. I would place an increased emphasis on it. But, yeah, it's not the thing they do the best. So that's going to be something interesting because it doesn't matter how many shots you block. If Southern is trying to shoot from three-point, and mind you, the top three shooters are pretty, or the top three scorers are pretty good at shooting threes, it doesn't really matter how many shots you're blocking. That perimeter is going to be way more dangerous. So Grambling might have to shoot a couple more threes too. Don't get out of your game. Don't get out of pocket. Just make sure that you are playing your game. But maybe take a couple of more threes. Not enough to, to where you're out of your game plan, but just maybe a few more. And then defensively, I'm wanting to push everybody off the perimeter. I'm trying to funnel everything inside. Because at the worst, they're getting two points instead of three. From Southern, I'm trying to shoot everything from three. I'm not even trying to touch the, the inside. Get some mid-range, take my shots here and there. But for the most part, I'm going to do what I do. Shoot three-pointers. Nobody takes more. Nobody makes more. Not many people average more. They're second or in the, in the percentage. Nobody makes a better percentage. They're second in that in the conference. I'm going to do that because that's what, that's what I do well. So now the thing you need to watch is the offensive attack of Southern. Can Grambling force them off the perimeter? Can they funnel them inside? Can they make them have to take inside shots? Or will Southern continue to shoot and make as many threes that they had as they have as far as the season has been going? That's something that you need to watch. And that's going to be a key if we're going to do this like the game of the week. That's going to be a key to victory for both teams. How is Southern's three-point offense affected? Is it good or is it bad? And that might really be a deciding factor in the matchup. And we're going to talk about North Carolina a and because we're, we're switching gears. We're going to go ahead and talk about the opening press conference for Vincent Brown and look at some of the, the best quotes from that. Before I get into that, however, today's episode is also brought to you by Built Bar. Built Bar is the number one protein bar on the market, bar none. I don't care who you're talking about. They don't measure up to Built Bar. They don't. Go to Walmart. Go to, go to uh, Sam's Club. You can get the variety pack. You can go to Built.com and you can actually just get the one you want. But if you want to try some things out, and trust me, if you get the variety pack, they ain't, I promise, they're going to be hitting 10 for 10. 
Every single one you get, you go, my man, this is actually delicious. I, the mouth of the South ain't lying. So go ahead and go to uh, Walmart. Go ahead and go to Sam's Club. But if you can wait, if you can take a little bit of time, I'm going to give you a deal. And you can get one of these delicious covered in chocolate protein bars and filled with protein, delicious and healthy at the same time. You can get one of these delivered to you in just a short amount of time. If you go to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15, I'll get you that 15% off your offer. Just go to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15 and it'll get you 15% off your offer. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate all of y'all for making it to segment three. And we're going to be talking about North Carolina a and new head coach, Vincent Brown, because he just had his opening press conference. And I had a couple of things from there that I wanted to highlight because I thought it was a good press conference. It set some tones. It, it kind of told you, told you what to expect, what he expected, why he took the job, all of that normal stuff. But I did want to take a couple of quotes and just say what I took away from it. So... Excuse me. One of the biggest quotes from the press conference had to do with what he expected in moving to the CAA. They talked about what it meant to be an HBCU in the CAA. I don't want to really go over that. But this is what he said. Or excuse me, this was A.D. Earl Hilton. He said, Coach Brown has helped us look at our needs from a facility standpoint and an equipment transportation standpoint. So we're going to make some of those changes immediately. The man has been in the CAA. He knows what it takes to succeed. He knows how they do business. They know, he knows how they prep. He knows all of these things. And I've had conversations with Mo Carter about uh, a school in Alabama. I can't remember what school it was, but they switched conferences. And when they switched conferences, there were certain things that they had to do. They had to do X, Y, and Z so they could get the media rights. The difference between that situation and this situation isn't really noticeable. The difference is one was a requirement. One was a unspoken requirement if you want to be competitive. One, you actually had to do. Like, if you didn't do this, you weren't going to get the media rights and you had to assimilate to what their standards are. And if you want to succeed, you have to do things the way the CAA does it. And it's not a, well, you're in a new, you're a new neighborhood. These are the rules. These are the guidelines. No, it's I'm in a new conference. And if I want to be successful, I have to prep the way they do. I have to, I have to put money in the places that they put money to. It's a requirement. That's not anything saying bad about North Carolina A&T or the status of the program now, but we have to understand where they're going. They do business a certain type of way, and it's the way you win. And that's, that's, just, that's just how I feel, it, I feel about it. Excuse me. So I'm glad they're consulting Coach Brown on something more than just coaching. You know, like, oh, well, we want you to go ahead and coach these guys. We want the style of play that the CAA has. No, if you get a coach who has been in the CAA, you come over and you say, so how they do business over there? What their facilities look like? What are they doing to be so good? Where, what, what would we need to improve to be able to compete with them? Because you've seen them. You know how they get down. You see how we get down. Can we still be successful over there? Oh, no, not if we don't do this. Well, we got to do this then. Now, the next quote, excuse me, is... Is, is the changes that need to be made in the conference. It's kind of a continuation of the same thing, but less of what to expect, and then more so just like, okay, this is what they do. And this is Coach Brown. He said they allocate significant resources to recruiting very talented players. And while that could be something that's just, okay, that's what they do. It could be nothing. I'm going to tell you why this is something that popped out to me. Because when looking at the rest of the, of the press conference, then you got Chancellor Martin. He said there are probably no weeks where uh, there's probably no weeks to go by where we, me and A.D. Hilton, um, aren't discussing areas of opportunity for growth and alignment, competitiveness, areas where we need to make more investments. When you combine that statement, especially that last part, areas where we need to make more investments. Well, what did Coach Brown just say? They allocate significant resources to recruiting very talented players. Y'all think that's not the same thing? It's just different wording. Investments allocate allocating allocating resources to a certain area and having areas where we need to invest is the same thing so when he says i have areas i need to invest in i'm immediately thinking about recruiting i'm thinking about recruiting i'm thinking about um, um the facilities i'm thinking about equipment transportation all of these three these three quotes that i just brought up they kind of go hand in hand because they all line up around the same thing and then lastly why did he accept the job? You know, I'll tell you this. I didn't want to talk about Coach Washington, but basically it sounded like they wanted a new 
they just wanted something new going into the CAA. They talk, they start talking about differences on alignment and man, you just wanted something new going into a new conference. That's what I took. And ain't nothing wrong with that if that's how you feel. But that's what I took from it. So he was very cut and dry about it. So I'm going to be very cut and dry about it. And we're going to move back to Coach Brown because I want to say, why did he take the job? And this was his quote. He said, I feel like at this point in my coaching career, I didn't want to take a job because I wanted to be a head coach. It had to be the perfect alignment. <laughs> there goes that word. Perfect alignment from an academic and athletic excellence in a cultural perspective. When they ask coaches, why did you take the job? I don't really buy much into it. It's all lip service. I don't really place much value and much, much, much weight in those words, just to be honest. It's like, it's like, okay, what are you going to say? Oh, yeah, they got good academics. Oh, yeah, I like the athletics. That's standard. I don't want to call it politically correct, but that's pretty standard. That's not really saying much to me. You know, like, okay, yeah, I'm sure the, academic, I'm sure the academics mean something. But I'm also sure it wasn't the the deciding factor. You know, that that's just that's my personal feel on it. That's my personal feel on it. But um, so when they when they give these answers, I I I I just kind of pass by it. But when I look at the rest of this cultural perspective, and that's something else that he spoke about. He said North Carolina A and T is way more family oriented than William and Mary was, which is where he just came from. They have fans. North Carolina a t has family. And I thought that was dope. I know I just said that real sentimental. But I thought that was pretty cool. And I really did like that, that quote. I thought it was a nice difference. So I think that when he mentions cultural perspective, that's something of value. That's not the, the same old, same old. You're not going to hear that in every single press conference. And I love when coaches give us something that's not from the, the, the script. Oh, yeah, I took this job because I really do like the area. I think that we can win. I think that there's a history of success here. No. Do I want to bring success back to the program? No. But when you say culture, when you bring up that difference, I love it. And then also, I didn't want to be a head coach. If everything was lip service, it's like, okay, at least you're making North Carolina a and sound like it's a job that was very desirable. I didn't just want it just to want it. So those are my keys, uh, or not my keys, but those are my top quotes that I took from his press conference on tomorrow's episode. Wow, today's Friday. On Monday's episode, we're going to be breaking down some of the best action, including Grambling versus Southern and then also Jackson State versus Prairie View as we continue pushing with basketball season and get into the flow of things. So I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day. For your second listen, check out everything you want around college basketball with Locked On, Bas or Locked On College Basketball wherever you get your podcast, including this app here. In the meantime, in between time, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.